basically, old magic is dumb. Episode 7 We start with the city of Lingoth cheering for some of the High Guardian Academy students as they set off on a quest. I do like that we see Parsley's entire family cheering her on. That's nice growth from the home life situation we saw in episode 4. Time points out that cheering from the town is more making fun of the new students and trying to psych them out by telling them how dangerous the cave they're going to is more than anything else. Also, who is this? At first I thought she was just a background character, but she's consistently in every shot of the opening sequence, has a speaking role where she's getting more and more scared of the upcoming test, and has even stolen Snapdragon spot next to Amaryllis, which seems really out of character considering how rabid Amaryllis is about guarding Snaps' um, minion status. Also don't worry if you're confused about what the scary test actually is, because apparently nobody informed the students either. Townsfolk always come out to freak out the first years. Imagine if your entire city threw a parade for the sole purpose of trying to give you a nervous breakdown about your upcoming exam as you walk to school. You've heard the legends, all of Redbud's clothes are from students who plunge to their death. <laughs> Why is this woman a teacher? Anyway, the triad over here have some meaningless exposition explaining to the audience in great detail that the students are scared. I'm not kidding, they have the headmaster literally explain to us why the students we just saw be nervous about the potentially deadly exam are nervous. This would be shameless exposition dumping, but here they're doing it for the sole purpose of making sure the audience knows that the students are scared. Because we're too dense to figure out that ourselves, I guess. I'm sorry, I know I'm sounding hypercritical so early in the video and we only just started, but there's already just a lot. And also, I've watched this episode and I know what's about to come. Boring! I miss the days when we used to just throw them in lava. After the intro, our group of students reach the cave they're going to do the challenge in and are briefed by the ethics teacher. The students are to be grouped up and the first thing we learn is if a group fails the challenge, they will be expelled. Not, they will have failed the year or anything like that. Expelled. But why? Anyway, this is the last straw for Zinnia. She completely snaps and asks why they're being sent into a cave with monsters and who knows what else, and why anyone thinks this is a good idea. When nobody can give a better answer other than because we want to be guardians, she nopes out and leaves. We never see this character again. <sighs> Okay, so this isn't that important, but it really bothered me when I watched this episode for the first time. Why on earth did you bother giving this character so much attention at the start of the episode show? This would indicate that this character we've never seen before is going to have some level of primary focus in the episode of the day plot. But instead, you spend all that time building her up as a plot piece just to immediately remove her from the episode, with her having no major impact on anything in this episode's story. You could have had the scene where she freaks out and quits and not have had a single scene in the opening sequence. You didn't even need to show her and nothing would have been different. It's such a bizarre and bungled handling of basic storytelling that this moment in particular just really grinds my gears for some reason. This hasn't been as big a problem in the last few episodes, but once again, this show comes back to doing what it does best, wasting time on meaningless nonsense that contributes nothing. For the record, I find cowardice and others very attractive. These maps show the caves and corridors down to level 3, where you will find the spring of healing waters. Below level 3, the risk level exceeds your training. Questions? Yeah, I have one. Which video game was the main writer of this episode obsessed with when they wrote this? Because this is some bullshit gamer-style MacGuffin hunting if I've ever heard it. At least Time is awake this episode and asks if the healing water could heal, let's say, a tree. The teachers just kind of shrug and go, yeah sure, why not? Which makes me wonder what exactly they want this healing water for. But then I put the brakes on my own thoughts because as we all know by now, these are things none of the writers bothered to think about. Time needs water to heal the tree, which was presented as the main plot, and it just so happened one of the school's tests will provide her with the solution to fixing the singular tree at the edge of the school grounds. Will it be useful in the larger plot? I have no idea, mostly because the larger plot has so far not bothered to show up yet. 
The gang set off to follow their school appointed map to their fountain, but Parsley says she knows a faster way to get there. Somehow. Don't question it, don't question it, there are no answers, don't make sense out of nonsense. They almost instantly reach a fountain underneath a forest, but it's dried up. Rose tries the universal solution of banging on it, but all she manages to do is get the group attacked by a swarm of Travers. <laughs> Swords! Nature's hell sticks. They'll fucking slice a baby in half. I have no idea why this fight is so violent. So far this show has been PG at best aside from time saying shit in one episode. It's like that for mature audiences only warning at the start was forgotten only for the show to suddenly go, oh right, this is supposed to be for adults, not children despite every single thing about it so far being represented as being for children, and decided to try and course correct by adding copious amounts of blood in a fight scene. Bright red blood from insects, mind you, which just feels weird to me. Not because it's blood, I don't actually care about that. It's just weird to see insects bleed red. This whole sequence just feels so contrived and artificial if you ask me. Anyway, Rose gets a bad cut from the Trevor Queen. The group runs away into a side passage that gets blocked by falling rocks. They don't have a map for level 3 of the cave, whatever that means, and so decide to just try and figure a way out. Sage doesn't want to leave without completing the quest because she doesn't want to get expelled, which actually fits in with her character of constantly being anxious about her school performance. Time agrees because she wants to use the healing water for the tree. Rose doesn't mention she's been wounded, which is annoying, but I'll let this one slide since the characters are obviously very focused on not failing and I can at least understand a stupid character like Rose making the choice to hide a serious injury because she doesn't want to jeopardize the test. The group is confused as to why Travers would be aggressive, but figure it might be due to the well in that area being dry. You'd think the rot might be used as a plot device here to show how it can corrupt things that aren't trees, but the show didn't think of that. They keep walking and find a section of the cave set up to look like, I don't know, what would you call this? Generic storybook fantasy room? It makes me think of a scene from a random Jack and the Beanstalk room where Jack finds, um, the singing harp. It doesn't have a function, it's just generic fantasy room. They find another fountain adjourned with the image of a woman who would turn her suitors into wine and then drink them, which is kind of metal, but also I continue to ask why every single character in this show is a sociopath. I miss the days when we used to just throw them in lava. <laughs> that cave has barely swallowed up a bushel of kids. This well is dry as well though. As they turn to leave, Rose finally goes down for the count. The following scene as the others try to help is really weird and uncomfortable. It's clear the writers wanted the scene to really show how serious the wound is and how dire the situation is by having all three of the other characters jump into action to help and have Sage appropriately freak out. But then they have Rose herself speak drunkenly about not getting what's going on. It's like they're trying to undercut the seriousness with comedy while also playing up how serious this is. They should have just had Rose stay quiet or something because the tone here is very, very confused. That's right. No map. Can someone of you tell me where the most magical fountain is? I do like that Sage immediately gives up on the idea of the quest and says she doesn't care if they get expelled, she just wants Rose to get to safety. So that's a rare point in her favor. Anyway, Animal Rumpelstiltskin shows up to be annoying. Parsley does the smart thing and asks if he knows how to get to the healing fountain. When he starts on about riddles and nonsense, time threatens him with violence. We then have a long sequence of this character called Buckles giving them a riddle, turning on the fireplace and letting them know that if they get this riddle wrong, he'll eat them. They figure the riddle out almost instantly when Rose notices there are four shadows, meaning there are four buckles. And as a reward, he throws an egg at them and the four buckles start arguing over which one screwed up. All this while we have one of our main characters bleeding to death on the floor. What is this episode's tone? Anyway, Buckles drops them down the trapdoor and they continue on to a giant diamond cavern. 
Inside, they find a stalactite dripping the magic healing water. I hate the sequence with Buckle so much. Just everything about it. The weird generic fantasy room inside a cave where everything is massive in scale, where a little bastard that looks like this lives to give it a riddle that's solved instantly as the tone of the episode shatters right in front of our eyes. Back to the diamond cavern, Sage feeds Rose some of the magic healing water and she's back to normal. Really glad this serious injury of one of our main characters was on screen for maybe 5 minutes at most before it was instantly fixed and didn't actually influence the plot in any way at all since they already were looking for the healing well anyway. So all of this was pointless. Anyway, Sage scooping out some of the healing water activates the room's guardian statues. While the others are distracted, Thyme fills a vial with the magic water before they regroup to figure out how to break something made out of diamond. Our weapons can't break diamonds! It's the hardest element. Only diamonds can crush diamonds. How do you know if a diamond is real? The first thing I want to ask you is please don't hit it with a hammer. It will break. A diamond is the hardest substance known to man, but because it's so hard, it's also brittle. So they defeat the giant statues, but now they're trapped inside the cavern. Looks like we're all going to die here after all. This may sound like the usual funny one-liner from Time, but she, she's actually serious. The characters instantly accept death without one singular attempt to even think of a way out. And of course, this leads to the only logical thing you can do while you wait to starve to death in the forgotten cave. Play truth or dare. Why are we still here? Just to suffer. What is this episode's tone? I mean this both as a scream of frustration as well as an honest question posed to the writers. What exactly was your goal for a tone in this episode? Was it meant to be a more serious episode with higher stakes as you tried to set up at the start? Was it meant to push our characters into a more serious situation so they'd be forced to open up about themselves more? Was it supposed to be irreverent and purposefully dismissive of the overly serious situation to come across as edgy? Bullshit. Was it meant to be funny that our characters aren't taking a very serious situation seriously? Please, I, I just want to know what your target was so I can accurately figure out how bad your aim is. <sighs> so we play truth or dare because fuck it I guess. What's writing got to do with it? Oh wait, it's not called truth or dare because changing the name of meaningless time wasting is what this show thinks world building is. Someone studies two weeks before school starts? Were you? Kissing someone? Uh, perhaps a young mouth breather named Cyborg Double File has never kissed anyone. Sage uses her turn to make time compliment Rosemary, which is pretty manipulative, but then again, this is truth or dare, that's the point of the game, really. And we're seven episodes in, and Time is still not friends with Rose or Sage, so I guess we need to start getting on that if we have any hope of unifying the main group before the story's over. Time asks Parsley who her least favorite brother is. Hmm, I used to hate Thistle, but then Spurge almost drowned and Thistle saved him, and I know I don't hate Thistle. I don't hate anyone. Ever. Rose? Okay, so the writers are aware of Parsley's main character traits as the core of the friend group, the one best at befriending others, and the one who could logically bring all four main characters together. So it's not that they're unaware of her character, they just chose not to use it. Cool, glad we got confirmation that it's not obliviousness, it's just incompetence. Anyway, Rose takes the opportunity to tell her friends that her mom is missing and that she's sad about it. For once in the show's history, however, it actually serves a purpose, as hearing Rosemary be sad about her mom encourages time to open up about her own family, and we finally, finally after seven episodes get some context and substance to the main plot. Time reveals that the rot has devastated the fairy woods, and that her mother had taken her and fled to Lingarth while her father stayed behind. Apparently her father and mother had a big fight before they left, and Time has not heard from him since. She entered the Guardian Academy to try and find a way to get back to her dad, and she was hoping the healing water might be an answer to undo the decay. Thanks for telling us. 
Ugh. I hate it when feelings come out of my face. It's okay. We're your friends. <laughs> and so, finally, we have our main core friend group. And it only took lying down and accepting death to do so. You know how I would have done this scene in a way that does not sabotage this episode's tone and get us at the exact same outcome here without making the characters doormats who just roll over and die when faced with hardship? Have the door get blocked off by the crumbling diamond statues and the group discover they can't get out. Have time get furious that after finally finding something which might actually save her home and reunite with her father, she now cannot escape. Have her angrily and hysterically try and find a way out of the cave, yelling about how this is not fair. The other characters try and calm her down and suggest they all look for a way out together, only to have time snap at them that they have no idea what this means to her, and that they might all be here to play at being heroes, she's trying to save her dad. The other characters can act shocked at this outburst and time, seeing their reaction, calms down enough to break and tearfully admit the situation with the rot and the fairy woods and all the backstories she's just given us. Then we have the exact same scene, have a consistent serious tone and re-establish the stakes, as well as showing our main female characters as being proactive and eager to find a solution to a problem, rather than have them just give up and wait for rescue or death without even trying. Seriously, the solution is so easy, and yet they somehow still found a way to fumble the setup in the worst way possible. As the characters fart around wondering why the other wells are dry, Parsley casually mentions they should try not to break the dragon egg. Apparently, the others didn't realize that's what this thing Buckles gave them was. Learning it's a dragon egg, Sage dunks it in the healing water to make it into a full-grown adult, because healing water excels growth? Look, I don't know, okay? Sage's meddling with the natural order has them now with a fully grown dragon freaking out in the diamond cavern trying to get out, which Sage somehow knew is what would happen just as she knew the healing water would turn an egg into a full-grown adult, I guess. The dragon digs out the rock slide and the group ride it out of the cave. Then the dragon slowly decays to bones like it's Skyrim or something and... I'm okay. <laughs> Bye, take you know what, fuck you. Time heals the tree, yay. Is the level of magic in the earth fading? I think so and I plan to stop it. Oh look, it's the main plot we've been neglecting and... <laughs> what? Oh see, do not steal Cause it's hard to save the world When you're falling in love Okay, so now we need to take a detour into explaining the difference between reference, a parody, a homage and just being creatively bankrupt. A reference is pretty straightforward. You have a show or a movie, you have a brief little thing which has zero impact on the story and isn't even acknowledged by the main characters too much and takes up zero extra screen time but is merely contained within an already functional scene. Simple. A parody is different. The definition of parody is something that exists as a representation of something else with exaggeration placed in a way that it brings the original source's ridiculousness or bad qualities to the forefront. In terms of parodying existing fictional media, there are generally two approaches. The first is parodying a very specific show, character, or iconic scene. This is the most common form of media parody. Of course, with this style of parody, you severely narrow your audience because you are operating under the belief that the person watching your story already has outsider knowledge of the work to understand why a parody is funny. Unlike some other Robin Hood, I can speak with an English accent. I haven't seen any other Robin Hood, so I don't understand the joke. I'm sorry. Which is something you don't really need to worry about with the other kind of parody. The other kind of parody, which I find to be the much more long-lasting and much more successful and interesting kind, is the parody of an entire genre within a singular work. For example... 
Blazing Saddles is not a parody of any specific singular western film. Instead, it makes a point of making a mockery of every upbeat Americana rugged dancing singing cowboy movie ever made this side of Italy by asking one simple straightforward question. Where are all the black people in these movies? Because you know where the black people are in these movies. Stock that chink a day's pay for napping on the job. Yes, sir. With one simple observation, the shiny, squeaky clean, dancing scene depiction of the Old West was destroyed forever. Although not solely Blazing Saddles' fault, Italy had been making waves with the grittier, dirtier, nastier version of the American West for about 10 years before Blazing Saddles came out, and El Topo somehow managed to exist. But it was Blazing Saddles that effectively ruined the American cowboy movie as it had existed up until then, forever. Because once you ask where are the black and Chinese people in this happy, sunny, fun western setting, you can never take that question back. Because even if you try, the audience is going to remember. This happened again with the movie Airplane that came out in 1980. Airplane, despite having some specific movie references within it, was a spoof of the entire 1970s disaster movie that had been massively popular until then. And, just like Blazing Saddles, killed the genre overnight. I just want to tell you both, good luck, we're all counting on you. When it comes to Magical Girls, a reference would be something like the Sailor Moon manga that can be seen in Steven Universe. A parody would be something like Papillon Rose as an entire show, or the scene in Megas XLR where they run into not Sailor Moon who does an overly long transformation sequence. Also, simply taking tropes and genre switching them doesn't automatically make something a parody. There's also just simple inspiration. The only thing that separates inspiration from blatant theft is to what level you let the inspiration influence your work. Just because you can tell where something got its inspiration from doesn't mean it's automatically a ripoff. Everything builds on everything else to a certain extent. Mad Max begat Fist of the North Star, which begat Berserk, which begat Final Fantasy VII. You can see the inspirations, but Final Fantasy VII is no more a ripoff of Berserk than Persona is a ripoff of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. So then we get to the one that is hardest to pull off, and that is Homage. A homage is the opposite of a parody, in that it is an attempt within a work to pay tribute and respect to a previous work, usually within the same genre, but not always. I've seen a lot more instances with modern cartoons where they will copy something from a much better anime wholesale as a big emotional climax and then cover their asses by saying it's a homage. But the thing is, these things are not homages. What these things are, if we are completely honest with ourselves and each other, are cartoon creators who worship someone else's work and desperately want to create something that can have a similar emotional impact on others. But instead of trying to cultivate its own impactful moment or visuals, the show directly copies that which it admires due to a lack of confidence that what the creators can craft themselves could match what they idolize. Or it's just incompetence, but honestly, that's actually very rare. And the annoying thing is, this works a lot of the time. Audiences are so starved of good content that caters to their tastes that they will eagerly eat up a copy of something else they like, simply because they are so ecstatic to find a cartoon that's even aware of their other interests. You're gonna look at me and you're gonna tell me that I'm wrong? Am I wrong? Okay, so what is a good example of a homage done properly then? If you've never seen the anime Recreators, it's a show where fictional characters from a wide range of genres and different mediums have somehow found themselves in the real world. Learning that their existence is essentially a complete lie cooked up by human beings no more important and far less impressive than themselves, the fictional characters quickly split into two groups depending on their personal philosophies regarding this less than ideal reality. One group are the bad guys 
made up of characters generally from darker media who feel their creators are monsters for deliberately creating such suffering and pain and effectively being responsible for everything that's gone wrong in their lives. Because fictional or not, those events were experiences they had to live through. And the other group are characters from more idealized media who come to better understanding and work through the reality of an individual person being responsible for everything that has happened in their lives. There are no direct parodies of existing characters and recreators, but more characters made up of tropes and genres the audience of anime would be able to identify without pointing and going, oh that's obviously supposed to be cloud strife. The characters who side with creators include, among others, Celestia from a light novel and anime, Ryu Kanoya from a mecha anime, Meteora from an open world RPG, and so on and so forth. And among the characters who decide to rise up against their creators is Magane from a series of horror light novels, Elisteria from a very berserk style manga, and Mamika Kirameki from an anime called Magical Slayer Mamika. Magical Slayer! Mamika's original show is something more along the lines of Precure more than Sailor Moon or Utina, a magical girl show squarely aimed at younger children. <laughs> she is manipulated by the other characters into believing that people who create suffering must clearly be bad guys and should be forced to make their created stories happier. And since her original source material is written with very little nuance, it's easier for Mamika to be swayed into thinking this is a very black and white situation. Hurting people is bad, so they must be bad guys. But we don't have to kill them, we just need to get them to be nicer. Of course, the reason why the characters against the real world would want a magical girl as one of their group is obvious to anyone who's ever seen a magical girl fight. However, a big part of Recreators is how the characters operate in a similar fashion to the Fat Albert movie, in that the more time the fictional anime characters spend in the real world, the more complex and layered their personalities and way of thinking become. So although they may start as trope-specific representations of their genres, after a while they just become people. Eventually, Mamika comes to the conclusion that forcing their creators to change their stories or, more specifically, be killed for the inexcusable crimes of writing stories isn't justified. On top of this, she gains a very mature and adult perspective on not only both groups but the individuals within those groups. Just because she feels the anti-creator group are doing something bad doesn't mean she throws away the close friendship she's formed with Elisateria. But even with a more nuanced understanding of the real world, Mamika is still a magical girl. And magical girls exist not only to destroy evil, but to purify and heal wounded hearts and souls. Despite being possibly the singular most powerful character in the show, Mamika can't sway the leader of the anti-creator group and is killed. But just because she dies doesn't mean she failed. Her earnest desire to help the injured characters in the anti-creator group, her desire to meet everyone with love and understanding, and her undying belief in her friends is the catalyst for Elisateria, her closest friend, to rethink her perspective as a tortured victim. And it is because of Mamika's influence throughout the show up until this point that Elisataria is able to rethink her own trauma and see the injustice and pain the anti-creator group is inflicting on what are, at the end of the day, innocent people who only wish to tell stories that can inspire and comfort others. This is a magical girl homage. 
It doesn't directly reference any specific Magical Girl show. It isn't copying any specific outfits or attacks or weapons, nor is it copying any specific transformation sequence. But Mamika is a truly heartfelt homage to Magical Girls and their values. And it's very clear that the writers fully understood the Magical Girl genre at its core, beyond just being about cute girls who transform and shoot sparkles. So now let's circle back to High Guardian Spice. Also, welcome back if you skip the spoilers. I hope you enjoy Recreators, it's, it's one of my favorite shows. So this is Olive. She's the black cat we've been seeing hanging around the whole show so far who hasn't actually done anything. It turns out she's part of some or other shadowy group of bad guys who have been ordered to kill our main heroes. Something she says she's uncomfortable with. That coupled with the fact that she's a blatant Mew Ichigo recolor is all you need to guess that she's gonna have a face turn pretty soon. Uh, there's so much wrong with everything here, we're gonna have to take this in parts. First, Olive's design is Mew Ichigo. Or more specifically, her design is Tokyo Black Cat, which was the proto Tokyo Mew Mew manga, but I'm not sure the writers even knew about Tokyo Black Cat. So she's just a blatant Mew Ichigo recolor. Specifically Mew Ichigo, not just a random anime cat girl. The anime cat girl design is one I used to really really hate when I was younger, mostly because I didn't think it was good character design to just take an anime waifu and stick ears and a tail on her and claim it's somehow magically a good character design now. I've since changed my perspective however and these days I think anime cat girls are pretty good. <laughs> But with Olive, it's more than just adding ears and a tail. Cardcaptor Sakura actually has a cat girl outfit, which is one of her more popular dresses. But if you were to put her next to Olive, apart from ears and tail, there isn't much that's similar here. Same can be said if we look at Sailor Luna. These are clearly different designs despite also being magical cat girls. But when you put Olive next to Ichigo, yeah, there's no denying they copied the design here. Part of it is due to silhouette. Sakura's cat girl silhouette is very different to Olive's, with her large frilled shoulders, high collar, extra flourish by her skirt and apron style front which gives her a more triangular upper body shape. Olive and Ichigo on the other hand both have bare shoulders, a corset style top piece, a poofy bottom skirt or bloomers, and adornments around their wrists. Gloves in Ichigo's case, cuffs in Olive's case. Sakura is wearing long sleeves and leggings that break up her design into two very stark and opposing colors, whereas Olive and Ichigo are both beard skinned in exactly the same places. So even with different colors and a different skin tone and a different body type, there is no way you can look at these two next to each other and go, oh yeah, Olive is clearly designed from a place of originality. I think it's pretty sad that Kissy Cutie Mew Mew, who is supposed to be a parody of Tokyo Mew Mew, has a more original design than Olive does. Second, we are on episode 7, there has not been a single indication that an evil force even exists in this show beyond a brief mention in the intro theme song. Despite the show's complete disinterest in it, the main plot so far has been the rot. And sure, with Olive appearing here, we are led to understand that the bad guys are probably behind the rot, but the show has spent the majority of its time focusing in very, very hard on the old magic versus new magic debate. And so it should have been obvious that something about new magic, a magic described as giving immense power without cost, does in fact have some harmful side effects and payments, since we all know that you can't get something from nothing. There's always an equivalent exchange. And the more powerful something is, the higher its cost. But suddenly we have a floating orb of concentrated evil appear and demand a magical cat girl kill our main heroes, because they are, quote, closing in on the secrets of which country, which good luck trying to figure out what that means. Because here we are, once again at the question about world building this show never bothers to ask, let alone answer. We only know which country, as a briefly mentioned place Amaryllis is from, and Sage's family used to live in until who knows when, since she and Rosemary have been friends for forever apparently. So how exactly is which country tied up in all this? Does which country make Terra Spheres? 
I don't even want to ask that question, honestly, because in doing so, I feel like I'm writing the story for the writers rather than have them doing their jobs. Also, I don't know that our main character's stumbling around for six episodes trying to do school stuff and then in one test finding some healing water counts as homing in on the secrets of which country. My guy, they don't even know what the rot is. We don't even know what the rot is. We don't even know what which country is. How are we homing in on anything? It's a wet fart of an ending to what is the absolute worst episode in the entire show. And although it never gets quite this bad again, it never really gets better either. Oh god, we still have two more episodes of this video left. Jesus Christ, what a fucking shit show. Episode 8. We start with Olive still hanging around the tree. She says to her floating fireball boss that since the girls didn't tell anyone about the rot, she shouldn't have to kill them. You know, I really appreciate the show introducing a bad guy that's going to have a face turn later on in the show, but decides to completely skip the part where they show the bad guy as a bad person. So we can just speed run right past the whole messy character arc thing. Honestly, that seems to be a reoccurring problem with this show. The writers are terrified of making the character they want us to like do anything that could be viewed as more than slightly mischievous, but in general still pure as the driven snow. I hate to break it to you guys, but you can't have a villain redemption story if you don't do the villain part. Anyway, so the floating fire guy just undoes time's healing water spell. So we have final confirmation that the rot is caused by a group of shady evil figures operating behind the scenes and actually have absolutely nothing to do with the old magic versus new magic plot as an ethics debate that's been the majority focus for 7 episodes in a 12 episode series. Part of me seriously wonders if the new magic and old magic argument was the initial plan when they started and they just pulled a hard left into having generic villains be responsible when they weren't able to do the world building needed to have a plot based on ethics. As we already know, this show started animating its first two episodes before writing was completed. So goodbye pointless old magic versus new magic debate. In the end you taught us nothing about the world gave us no insight into how the show setting works and only served to eat up screen time. I would say you won't be missed, but I'm just angry you wasted my time. Anyway, Fire Guy gives Olive a spell to turn everyone into rocks and shatter them. Oh, also the bad guys are called the Triumphant or something? It doesn't matter. I just thought it was odd to have the bad guys have a name so similar to the Triad. Also, I look forward to me calling them the Tribunal for the rest of the review because I'm terrible with names. After the intro, we get into what this episode and the next one are mainly going to be. Not Halloween, Halloween specials. To be fair, although it's trying to be a Halloween themed setting, the actual staples of Halloween are not exactly here apart from takes place in autumn and characters dress up. It's more like a weird fusion of Halloween and vaguely unspecific Asian festival. Which honestly, I think I prefer in this case. It seems like a thin justification for having Halloween in this fantasy setting, but at least it's more than just Halloween with the find and replace name. Rose, Sage and Parsley are waiting around the entrance of the academy, waiting for time. Kel shows up to be a creep towards them. Kel is Parnell's cousin, which they mentioned all the way back in episode 5 as being mean. He has some lame insults about Rose's dragon onesie and basically cat calls Sage before wandering off. Oh yeah, Rose is dressed in a dragon onesie, which honestly seems like a giant waste of potential as far as dressing your main characters in a cute outfit for Halloween goes, but whatever floats your boat. Parsley is dressed as her metal urgy professor, which... The blacksmithing teacher? That's not weird. Time is a werewolf, although she hates the costume, and Sage is... Krahe from Princess Tutu? Gender bent howl? Uh, I don't know. It's a cute outfit though. Oh, also, when Time complains about her costume, Sage casually mentions that in Lingoth it's literally the law to dress up for not Halloween. Um, <clears throat> what? I thought what made Halloween such a popular holiday in the US is because it's one of the only holidays without any obligations attached to it. Can I write a clickbait article about how High Guardian Spice is ruining Halloween? Back at the abandoned school, Neppy tosses a bunch of potions into a cauldron and TFs into his alt form so he can warn the gang about Oliver's plan. Oliver's watching the festival from the roofs, in admittedly some good looking shots. 
Oh, also the third cat's name is Kino. He's been around too, but I can promise you he never has a purpose or reason for existing. He's just here because Olive and Kino are based off of Rodriguez's real life cats. Why Nippy exists and why Kino wasn't used for his role in the story instead, I'll never know. Olive doesn't want to kill the gang, so she plans to turn them into stone with the Terrasphere the smoke guy gave her, but instead of shattering them, she's gonna take them to the tribunal so they can do the actual killing instead. We get a, let's be generous and call it a montage of the gang just aimlessly milling around with time looking miserable while Slime Boy plays the bandsaw. Olive approaches them and offers to give them an official guide to the festival which has a list of activities and such. Sage is displeased that Rose is speaking to another human being, does that shitty boyfriend thing where she takes hold of Rose's arm to mark her territory, and says that she's already drawn up an activity timetable for them to do. Olive is like, okay, and reminds them of how cool the finale of the festival at the bandstand is going to be. I thought this was to get them in the right place for her to cast the spell, but it's not. She makes a weird comment about enjoying it about as much as she enjoys belly rubs in what's supposed to be like a haha so quirky she's a cat girl slip but the joke doesn't really land so it's just kind of this big hollow thunk of a situation. <laughs> she was nice. I don't know. Something felt off about her. Ugh, don't be cynical Sage. It's a festival. Sheesh. Cynical. Somebody bumps time into a tree costume and she spontaneously developed PTSD in this episode's first half, so she has a triggered flashback. Sage is able to think of someone else for once and sympathizes that time is clearly not having a good time and hates her costume. Rose however mentions she doesn't want time to bail and insists they should all be having fun together. However, Sage gives Time the out to leave. Parsley offers to go with her because she's a decent person, but Time turns her down. What Time means is that extroverts are replenished by social stimulus, while introverts are depleted. <laughs> Thank fuck, I did not need to sit and listen to Sage explaining what an introvert is. We then have a true flashback of when Time and her mother left the fairy woods. I guess Time realized we're on episode 7 and since she's the only one who actually cares about the main plot, decides she's leaving to go back to her father with the healing water. We then cut to the best characters in the show that aren't Parsley. Kel comes up to Snapdragon, not recognizing him, and tries to hit him up. But when he realizes it's Snapdragon, he has a bit of a meltdown that he has been flirting with a dude. Kel is the kind of guy who unironically uses the term trap, isn't he? Funeral director, huh, Kel? <laughs> you better get out of here before the funeral becomes your own. Just in case you needed more proof that Amaryllis is objectively the best character in the entire show. There you go. Also, she's dressed as a pirate. Snap! You're a fabulous mermaid goddess challenger. And, 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 you're great! And who cares what Cal says? His costume is a suit. Let's go smash shit till you feel better. Back with the others, Rose is feeling overwhelmed with how many things she wants to do on the activity list. Sage says she's already narrowed down the choices of what they can do together. They meet up with Aloe and Anise, who introduce themselves to Parsley. I feel I should be surprised they don't know her yet, but honestly it makes sense. The girls stay at the dormitory at school, so they wouldn't have met her before. Although come to think of it, I don't understand why Rose and Sage stay at the school when Sage's cousins live a literal walking distance from it. Just one more pointless detail nobody thought about while making this show. I'm gonna guess the writers don't really know anything about school dormitories apart from it being a thing in Harry Potter and Little Witch Academia, so they wanted the aesthetic even when it made no logical sense. Also, Caraway shows up dressed like this, and there's this weird exchange. Oh, we uh... We go to the same parties. I have no idea what the joke is supposed to be. I get they're all gay, or it could be referring to being swingers, or... I, I, I don't know. Listen, if you're going to make a haha the kids don't know about our adult activities so we have to look embarrassed while giving a half-truth joke, you need to make it clearer what the basis of your joke is for me to understand it even if I don't find it funny. <laughs> 
I'm gonna guess this is what they were trying to go for, but I have no idea. So that's two jokes now, with all the construction integrity of an American building. Time returns to her mom's home to pack for her impromptu return to the fairy woods, now with an unexplained sexy version of her previous outfit. Speaking of unexplained, Parsley is suddenly at her family stand acting as a barker. Amaryllis with Snapdragon show up in tow, and Parsley makes the mistake of commenting that they're a cute couple. We're, We're not, not a couple. couple. I know, I know. Sage shows up having bought Parsley some food and literally bumps into Snapdragon. You just look so pretty right now, okay, bye! If I could make key smash noises with my mouth, I would. I'm serious, I genuinely really love the interactions between Sage and Snap, and I don't even like Sage. Their interactions feel genuine and honest. It's awkward and messy, but never comes across as like cringe or forced, or like the creators are shipping them and trying to force the relationship onto the viewers. It feels natural for two extremely awkward, anxious teenagers who genuinely like each other. Also, I think the setup with Sage's attraction is genuinely well crafted. We saw her spend a lot of time with Snap in the Obstacle Course episode, and although Snapdragon's crush is very clear, we don't see Sage respond in a romantic way too much apart from one or two comments making her flustered. But she and Snap mainly spend time in that episode when Sage isn't being horribly sexist towards him, talking. However, in this episode, when Snapdragon is dressed as a mermaid for the festival, Suddenly, Sage's blushing flusteredness spikes all the way up to 11. It's very subtle and it's building upon its own set foundations in earlier episodes and is a genuine piece of good character writing, which makes it fun to watch and you get invested in it. Come on, Snap. Time to lure pirates to their deaths or whatever. Yeah. Neppy arrives at the festival, sees Olive is hanging around and, spotting time, runs to warn her of Olive's plan. Sadly, he runs into a group of furries and or monster fuckers who cause him to crash into the bandstand and lose sight of time. Also, Slimeboy mentions Aloe is giving away space brownies, so apparently that's a thing. Rose and Sage are playing the carnival games. Rose is impressed by a rare shield, causing Sage to be surprised that Rose knows something about history. Rose laughs and says of course she'd know something about history if it involves dragons. Sage responds to this like, she's super defensive about it. Uh, uh, let me show you. You're not the only one who knows things about things. <laughs> I was kidding. Yikes. Yeah, I don't know what that's about. Parsley is done helping out at the family booth and rejoins the group, asking what they want to do next. Rose says she signed them all up for a challenge game with flaming axes, but Sage points out it's at the exact same time as the pumpkin carving contest. Oh wait, I'm sorry, pumpkin carving wouldn't be fantasy world building enough for this show. So it's pumpkin carving but with a different name. It's like pumpkin carving, but using ancient tools and adhering to very specific regional guidelines. So, pumpkin carving. Rose says she didn't see Sage sign them up, although she might either be lying or just feeling stupid for missing it, I can't really tell. Sage gets defensive, saying she thought Rose wanted to spend the festival together. Rose says she does, but she'd rather throw axes. Sage says that they always have to do what Rose wants to do, and that Sage really wants to do the pumpkin carving. Parsley tries to be the voice of reason, wondering if there's a way to combine the two games, but both Rose and Sage make it clear they don't want to compromise. Back with Time, she's just about to leave the town when Neppy catches up to her. He tries to warn Time about Olive and how he saw her speaking to a face of smoke, but due to the fact that his ability to speak is… not good, Time has a hard time understanding what he means. Neppy is able to clarify both to Time as well as the audience that what the Tribunal doesn't like is that they know both about the infected trees as well as the fact that the healing water cures the sickness. Something I'm pretty sure any idiot could figure out when they hear the word healing water, but whatever. Time tells Neppy to track down Olive while she goes back to warn the others. Meanwhile, Rose is busy playing one of those strength testers while Sage is passive aggressively sulking. Rose is annoyed that Sage is still upset that they missed the pumpkin carving and says that she'll, quote, do the next dumb thing Sage has circled. Sage gets angry at this, saying that Rose is being a jerk. Amaryllis has a rare moment of annoyingness as she explains to Snapdragon and the audience that Rose and Sage are about to have an argument due to pent-up resentment. Thanks, Amaryllis. 
I'm glad you're here to explain to me what's happening in the thing I'm currently watching. Snapdragon just nopes out of the situation, as Rose tells Sage that she can't expect Rose to get excited over things she doesn't find fun. She also very weirdly says that they don't need to be heroes today, they can just be kids, which is a good line in isolation, but at no point throughout the entire show has Rose shown any differentiation between having fun and being a hero. In fact, the complete opposite is true. Rose has the most fun when she is busy being a hero. She has fun when she's swinging her sword and going on adventures. On top of this, none of the characters has done a single thing that could qualify them as actually being heroes yet. The most adventurous thing they've done so far is getting the healing water. And even that was not a heroic quest or anything of the like. Although Time needed the water to save the trees, they didn't know this until they had already found the water. For them, the test was basically just a fetch quest as part of their school curriculum as set out by the teachers. The fact that they got into trouble and got hurt was due to the Travers being aggressive and them having to defend themselves. Nothing of what they've done can be classified as heroic. Adventurous? Sure. Heroic? No. So this would be a good one-liner for a different set of characters in a different show, but for this moment in time with these characters in this show, it doesn't make a lot of sense. You could try and write the story for the show creators and say that Rose is shaken up by the injury she suffered, but even directly following that event when they were all sitting around and waiting for their slow death from starvation, Rose's solution was to play truth or dare. Not exactly the actions of someone who has just gone through some form of trauma. Anyway, Rose asks Says if she knows how to have fun or if all she knows how to do is be a teacher's pet, even when the teachers are drunk with their asses. Her words, not mine. And then, this happens. I will play it for you instead of recapping it because I think you need to see this for yourselves in its raw form and not think I'm relaying the next line of dialogues through a bias filter. When we were kids, you had fun just being around me. You didn't need us to go spelunking into some stupid volcano full of hot knives just to consider it a fun day. And you were never, never this annoying. <sighs> Meanwhile, Sage seems really off kilter and saddened that she and Rose have different schedules. Remember this. Remember this. Okay, so let me break this down. Sage has, throughout the entire series, shown that she is extremely possessive of Rose's attention, to a rather toxic point. When they first get to the academy, Sage is upset that she doesn't share every single class with Rose, despite them having certain classes together. When Rose is crushing on Aster, Sage immediately decides within the span of seconds that Aster is a terrible person and spends the entire episode badmouthing him for the sole reason that Rose shows romantic attraction towards him. In this very episode, when Olive is just talking to Rose, Sage does the possessive arm grab. She consistently displays an extreme domination of Rose's time and attention, lashing out viciously towards anyone that takes any of Rose's attention away from her. Need I remind you, Aster was not the person in the Obstacle Course episode who first approached Rose. Rose was the person who immediately started crushing on Aster. And for the most part, Aster seemed barely interested in Rose other than being a generic girl he can impress. The decision to spend some of her time away from Sage was Rose's decision. But Sage, in response, lashes out at Aster and hyperfixates on every minute detail she can think of for why he is awful, despite never having even spoken to him, as well as emphasizing that Sage knows what's best for Rose. I know what she needs, and it's not him. Now in this episode, Rose wants to do something Sage doesn't, but Sage wants Rose to want to do what Sage wants to do. At first, she takes immediate charge and simply chooses the activities she wants to do and sign Rose up for them as well. When Rose mentions she wants to do something else, Sage tries to assert that what Sage wants to do is more important. When Rose doesn't cave, 
Sage falls into passive-aggressive sulking, making extremely sure that Rose is aware that expressing personal desires outside of Sage is a bad thing without actually communicating with her. Instead, going for guilt-tripping and emotional manipulation, something we've seen her do before with other characters. Rose, however, refuses to back down and in fact asserts as to why she wants to do the things she wants to do. It may not make any narrative sense in the larger context of the show, but in this particular moment, Rose has independent wants that she is trying to enforce because she wants to have fun like a kid. And it's at this point where Rose dares to put down a personal boundary that Sage snaps. Her immediate response is to further guilt trip Rose. In the past, all you needed to be happy was to be with me. How dare you express personal interests and desires now, when in the past we could do whatever I wanted, because being with me was good enough for you. But also, you're not allowed to do what you want without me doing it with you, because if you spend time with anyone who isn't me, you're making a horrible mistake because I'm the only person who understands you. I understand you better than you understand yourself. Why can't you see that? I know what's best, and what's best is doing whatever I want to do and you just coming along. And now that you have desires and interests that I don't share, your behavior is annoying. In the previous episode, where I didn't know you were hurt, I actively commented on how you're supposed to be more energetic and loud, and how that is how you always are, and I mentioned how that's how you should be behaving. But now that you're doing what I don't want you to do, the same behavior is now annoying. I'm not one to go hyperbolic with accusing fictional characters of real-world transgressions, but every singular action Sage displays gives me no choice but to give the firm statement that Sage is an abusive friend, and her method of abuse is control. And if you're having some trouble seeing it, just for a second, imagine if Sage was Rose's boyfriend. Rose is only allowed to do what Sage wants. If she isn't enthusiastic and loud, she gets criticized for not being herself. If she shows interest in another boy, that boy is the worst person ever and bad for Rose. If Rose wants to do something Sage doesn't want to do, she's hurting Sage's feelings because Sage was excited to do what she wants to do. If Rose stands her ground, she's being unreasonable, gets criticized for never needing the things to be happy before, and the exact same personality traits she was criticizing for not displaying when Sage wants her to is now used against her and called annoying. It's a very insidious form of abuse, one that doesn't need to involve physical violence or threats, nor does it need the two people to be in a romantic relationship with each other. It's a form of abuse which seems to have more positive moments than bad moments, as long as the abuser is satisfied with the control over their victim. Because the second the victim shows any individuality which does not fall in line with the abuser's desires and control, and you were never, never this annoying. Having disagreements between friends over what to do together or when to do it is bound to happen at some point in a friendship. Someone feeling their friend is dating the wrong person is also bound to happen sometimes. These things in of themselves are not controlling behavior. But when it is a consistent pattern for one person to pressure her control over someone and who also happens to display other behaviors of always needing absolutely everything her way, then it paints an extremely bad picture of that individual, or in this case, fictional character. Sage is not a real person. She doesn't have a psyche. All she has is what's been written for the show. The writers for this episode clearly wanted Sage and Rose to have a falling out, as Rose has here and there been behaving a little bratty in this episode regarding what the others want to do. However, Sage's behavior has been consistent throughout all seven episodes. Her lashing out at Rose like this does not feel out of character for her. The problem is, the writers absolutely did not intend for the second protagonist to be a horrible, controlling, toxic person. They wanted her to be an anxious nerd struggling with school and whose cool-headed intellectual approach to things balances out Rose's mindless enthusiasm and that their differences causes them to butt heads sometimes. But as Bennett the Sage once so wisely said, The strength of a story is not in its target, but in its aim. 
and the manner in which Sage has been written consistently paints her to be a bad person and is reinforced throughout the show when, given many different circumstances and many different settings, her response at every point merely reinforces the fact that she is a bad person. That is the character you have written. It's not the character you wanted to write, but that is the character you have written. Many years ago, I wrote a lengthy fanfic for My Little Pony, in which the main six characters in Discord go on a grand adventure. In the fic, I wanted to make it clear Twilight did not trust Discord at all and was antagonistic towards him. About halfway through the fic, I started getting comments that Twilight was being extremely unlikable and that her distrust of Discord had crossed the line from being annoyed and suspicious to just being petty and bitchy. So, I had one of the other characters try and talk to her about it, pointing out that she had crossed the line and was behaving mean-spirited. And I had Twilight deny this saying she was behaving perfectly normal and fine. And then I had all three characters thrown in jail, where they were forced to work together to get out, and had the third character demand the two of them stop being assholes and talk to each other, because they weren't going anywhere anyway, so they might as well use the opportunity to air out all the underlying tension. Afterwards, I adjusted how I wrote Twilight, and then when an emotional turning point happened for Discord in particular, I gave Twilight a bit of an oh shit moment where she realizes her suspicion was unfounded. And after the climax where all the adventuring was done, I had her not just apologize but express to Discord directly that she had changed her mind about him and that she had been wrong. I didn't mean for Twilight to have this subplot, but it's a subplot that became necessary to salvage her character. Sometimes we try and write tension and accidentally push the character too far into being mean. But if you end up in that situation, you need to acknowledge the character's fault and accept that your main character, who the audience is supposed to like, did something wrong. And if there is a consistent pattern with the main characters in High Guardian Spice, it's that the writers were unwilling to give any of their four main characters any real flaws whatsoever, ironically making them unlikable. Whereas characters who were written with the intended purpose of being problematic became the best written and as a result, fan favorites. This show doesn't want its main characters to look bad, which results in them becoming monsters. Back to the shit show. Olive has decided she's waited around long enough and starts with her plan to turn the gang into stone. Time runs into the others and quickly informs them about Olive's plan. Listen, I trust you. All of you. I know I've been, like, off. But I need you to trust me back, okay? This is nice. More of this, please. Time has been borderline antagonistic for the entire show towards Rose and Sage, but has more or less been forced to spend time with them due to her friendship with Parsley, and after opening up to them last episode, is now in a good position to ask for help, something she wouldn't have been able to do before now. This is good, I like her character growth. Meanwhile, Snapdragon has retreated to a corner where he's been crying over Kel's name calling. Amaryllis catches up to him to gossip about the fight, but, Seeing he's upset, changes her mind and puts a force field around the two of them. Making sure nobody and nothing can hear or touch us. Now talk! Take down the spell. Not until you tell me what's wrong! I don't want to! Ooh, beat that, Sage! Rah! I'm good here. The difference here is staggering. Anyway, Snap doesn't want to talk about it, so Amaryllis drops it and they decide to play fantasy VR games together although Amaryllis keeps the force field up so she can swear without getting in trouble. I refuse to comment on the existence of fantasy VR games. The gang and Nippy manage to track down Olive and they run to the roof to confront her. Olive reveals herself to have been the black cat in their dormitory up until now and that she's been spying on them. You'll meet the triumvirate soon enough. <laughs> you mean the triad, right? If I meant the triad, I'd say the triad. Idiot. Oh, okay, so the similar naming is actually a plot point. Okay, I retract my previous statement. You win this round, High Guardian Spice. 
Sage reaches for her terror sphere, but Olive disarms her before she can do anything, taunting her for not being able to use new magic before using her own terror sphere to steal time's healing water. She holds it hostage, telling them to come with her to the tribunal, but when they refuse, Time completely loses her shit and rolls initiative, but Olive can actually fight and after deflecting her arrows casts a magic glyph from the Oh My Goddess movie. Sage manages to get her terror sphere just in time to shield them before it goes off and turns every person in the festival to stone, except for Amaryllis and Snapdragon who are still behind their own force field. However, as she had run to grab Nepi and tried to get him under the shield as well, Parsley is caught in the spell and turned to stone. No! Well, that was a fucked up story. Okay, one more episode. Let's try to pick up the pace so I can keep this video under two hours. Episode 9. We start exactly where we left off. Olive was knocked out and wakes up distressed to see how wide the spell's AoE was. Her smoke boss comes to laugh at her for making a mess and how the tribunal is gonna have her hide if she messes up further. He gives her until dawn to murder the gang or he's gonna report her mistake and it's insinuated the tribunal will just murder her for the screw up. The gang's force field goes down and they assess the damage. Sage freaks out thinking that Olive's spell bouncing off her spell means it's her fault this has happened. Time's quick to tell her the only person to blame for this is Olive, and I have to agree with her. I don't like Sage, but in this case she didn't do anything wrong. I also appreciate her showing some sense of responsibility and compassion outside of herself, which also reminds us of her anxiety regarding her magic. The remaining three girls focus on fixing the spell first, and come to the conclusion that if Olive cast the spell, she should be able to undo it. Olive, meanwhile, is trying to psych herself up to murdering the group, while also working out the best way to pick them off based on their strengths before attacking. She takes out Time and Sage before focusing on Rose, but Rose parries her surprise attack. Olive taunts the gang before running off. Rose goes after her despite Sage negging her for being too reckless just like how she got hurt in the cave. Rose ignores her and runs off. Time and Sage move to look for Olive together among the crowd. Meanwhile, Amaryllis and Snap are still playing VR games. That's the third time it's destroyed High Guardian Academy. It should have taken us one try to beat this. It's for literal babies. Do I need to dignify this with a response? If you want to do a Ruby Chibi spin-off, just do a Ruby Chibi spin-off and save us this time wasting. Rose catches up to Olive, demanding they fight. Olive leads her into an alley before finally facing her. I've heard people call this fight scene cheap and badly done, but honestly, it's fine. Its biggest problem is it relies a little too much on shaky cam, but otherwise there's nothing really wrong with it. It's not the greatest fight I've ever seen, but it's serviceable. Rose manages to give Olive a nasty cut, causing her to retreat and Rose to give chase again. Back with Amaryllis and Snap playing their nonsensical VR game, Snap takes the opportunity to tell Amaryllis that she always orders him around and never says please. She doesn't respond to this, but she doesn't deny it either. They run into Time and Sage and realize what's happened when they take their goggles off. Time and Sage fill them in on Olive and the four go to find her together. While doing so, Sage mentions never having seen a spell like this even when she lived in Witch Country, something Amaryllis is shocked to learn as that's where she's from. Sage explains that she lived in the countryside, which is why she grew up without new magic. Amaryllis quickly assesses what kind of magic Olive would have used for the stone smell and remarks that it's really expensive and that Olive must be loaded. She also does what this show has refused to do up until this point and actually explains something about the magic system, pointing out that the thing Olive used was a ready-made spell contained within a stone, something brand new Amaryllis has only seen being sold the last time she went home. She says you don't need to actually know the spell, you just need to activate the stone when you want to cast it. After a brief argument about the ethics of ready-made spells, Amaryllis tells them all spells can be undone, but they need Olive's original terror sphere. And since Amaryllis is always on board for violence, she's more than happy to help them fight Olive as well. 
Meanwhile, back with Rose, she catches up to Olive, who isn't doing very well at the bandstand, where the rest of the group stops her from running away and disarm her. Olive still wants to fight, but time refuses since she's hurt, and demands to know who the Triumvirate are, and what they want with the gang. Upon hearing the name, Amaryllis' ears perk up and she asks what which country's big money guys have to do with this. They argue back and forth as Olive throws out threats and once again tells them to come with her. When they refuse and Olive grabs her terror sphere, Sage throws a spell at her and Olive vanishes in a flash of light. Rose and Sage start fighting but time calms them down since Parsley isn't around to be the voice of reason. Luckily, Olive left behind the ready-made spark spell and Sage crushes it, causing the spell to break and everything goes back to normal with no one even aware of what just happened. The gang relax and watch the fireworks since Olive is long gone. Time makes sure Parsley is okay but she says it was like she blinked, so she's fine. Amaryllis offers to find out why the tribunal is after them, since she knows people in which country and can ask around, but they turn her down, not wanting to draw attention. They consider telling the teachers, but since Olive mentioned they're being spied upon at the academy, they don't want to risk it. The group go their separate ways for the evening. Snap asks Sage if she'd like to watch the band together. I'm in. Actually, uh, never mind. I'd rather throw more money down more holes. Rose is as dense as always and completely misses the vibe and says she'll watch with them instead, but Sage tells her she wants to be alone with Snapdragon. Rose seems to take this personally and finds herself alone. Time takes a moment, realizing that without the healing water, there's no point in going home to her dad. Amaryllis asks Parsley if she has any idea how to win the VR game, and Parsley tells her it's based on teamwork. She had been playing it only giving orders. Sage introduces Snap to a niece and aloe, and Caraway mentions he's happy to see Snapdragon enjoying himself. The smoke boss tracks down Olive and tells her he convinced the tribunal to give her another chance, but they're going to send another agent to help her. Professor Caraway, who is voiced by Rodriguez, is seen flirting with one of Rodriguez's OCs, cosplaying as a Kitsune, complete with distracting Yaoi mist and Rose walks miserably through the festival, feeling alone and sorry for herself. Slimeboy starts singing a song, but since he's voiced by an actual musician, I assume the song is copyrighted and I can't play it, so please accept this substitute. Well, of the three episodes, this one was the best, but that's not saying a lot. What an absolute nosedive in quality from episode 6. When I got to episode 6, I genuinely thought the show was pretty much just as bad as its reputation, but had redeeming qualities that people weren't giving it enough credit for, and was at least interested to see where it was going since it seemed to be steadily improving. But immediately afterwards, all the good faith it was building up broke instantly with what is the absolute worst episode in the entire show. And following right on its heels is the episode where Sage's character reaches new lows in showing what a horrible person she is. Episode 9 is only saved by the fact that it's mostly focused on action and moving the story forward, so its pacing feels much tighter than previous episodes, and world building is introduced in a much more organic way by bringing Amaryllis in to give the rest of the characters information, which also informs the audience. If episode 9 was not tied to episode 8 and had happened before episode 7, I would even call it a good episode, but I cannot overstate just how bad episode 7 is. At least in episode 9, we finally gotten some more possible main plot by bringing an actual antagonistic force, since them wanting to stop the gang for knowing too much about the rot in the healing water makes them seem responsible for it. On top of this, we get given a hint as to who the bad guys are by Amaryllis recognizing their name and mentioning their some or other wealthy organization from her home. All of this would mean a lot more for this show if there were more than three episodes left to wrap up the story and deliver on all of these plot points. Or let us know what the main plot even is. That would be nice. Do you guys remember when 12 episode stories had plots? Because I remember when 12 episode stories had plots. We have three more episodes to go. Depending on how much I'll rant, I'll either wrap it up then, or I'll have a fifth video doing an autopsy of this thing. We'll see how it goes. As for right now, however, I, I need to go watch something else. 
Well, that's all the time we have on cautionary tales of sorts. Now, don't forget to go out and get any of my new books, like this one, Stories That Will Really Fuck You Up, or this one, Swords Will Fucking Slice a Baby in Half, A Story of Redemption. <laughs>